This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. This afternoon's speaker is Fran Handrick from the University of Birmingham. She's completing her PhD there um, on the general topic of Amish women and change. Thank you. So just a few facts before we start so we're all on the same page. The Amish are a Protestant Christian group and it goes back to the 16th century. They take their name from Jacob Ammon um, and it kind of uh, emerged um, around 1693. The United States welcomed Amish people from the period 1730s to the 1850, which is how they all came to go there. And there's um, Amish people now in 32 states and two provinces in Canada. Um, I guess the most well-known states for the Amish populations would be Pennsylvania, which is the oldest settlement, and Ohio, which is the largest. And as you go further west, there is another large settlement in Indiana, which uh, could be said to be the most liberal. 1900, the population was about 5,000, but now there's 327,000 of them. And they double their numbers every 18 years. Oh, I forgot to do these. So I'm just going to do a bit of background, then I'm going to talk about the previous scholarship on the Amish, then a bit about my, my own history and research process, then the changes, then something I'm calling unyielding flexibility, and then I'll, I'll be done. Um, Amish life is, um, as I said, orth embraces Orthodox Christian beliefs. The key thing about the Amish is that they're Anabaptists, so they only baptise believers, so they don't baptise... Um, babies, only those who voluntarily confess their faith in Jesus and agree to follow the regulations of the Amish church. Children of Amish parents are not considered to be Amish until they're baptised and they can really choose when that is and it's typically late teens, early twenties. And they, you might know that they have this period called Rumspringer when they can leave the community and go and live either live in the community or live outside the community and try the world that's very typical dress you'll notice those girls are barefoot you see lots of people lots of women barefoot and young boys as well um, the mother there has black 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 tights and black shoes and, and that that would be a very typical picture they have plain solid colors they never wear pattern material because few outsiders convert to the group, really they're more like an ethno-religious group than they are a Christian denomination. And most of them have their background from a German-Swiss heritage, something like that. Amish life is practiced in a church district and they're very... Um, oh, it's a bit dark there. Very typical picture for the men. They're very um, keen to stay within their own community so they don't do a lot of mingling with the English as they call anybody who's not Amish so even if you're American or Canadian or Nigerian or German you're the, uh, the English. A church district is made up of 20 to 40 Amish families that's usually about 120, 140 people and their lives are governed by the Ordnung which is the rules and the rules just cover a whole load of things that you would never imagine church life to cover got my hand myself oh oh sorry um so it covers things like dress codes employment acceptable labor saving devices in the house transport key thing about the amish is that they travel by horse and buggy there are four things that make somebody amish first of all they dress plain so the kind of clothes that you've seen on the pictures they travel by horse and buggy they speak pennsylvania dutch and they've made this commitment to the Amish church. The Ordnung is agreed by everybody in the church and it's changed or there's an opportunity for change twice a year. So it's not fixed and forever. They, they do change things and they discuss things. First language is Pennsylvania Dutch. Church attendance is fortnightly on a Sunday and it rot rotates among the households that make up the church meeting. They meet in barns or houses. Everybody has a room that will seat 120 people. Um, 
church attendance is not for the faint-hearted because you're sitting for three hours on a small backless bench. You've really got to want to be there. The church is their primary unit of social organisation and pretty much everything they do is grounded in small-scale face-to-face communication. They, they don't like the telephone. They do, they're good at letter writing. They do lots of letter writing. But they really value being face-to-face with people. They like small-scale because it doesn't give them the opportunity to get proud or to get too involved in something big. And many people will work for another Amish. They work together more than they would work for an English. In Indiana that has changed in the last few years because um, some people in Indiana work in factories making these very upscale uh, recreational vehicles and they do beautiful cabinetry inside these but they're never going to drive one or own one because they're not allowed to own a motorised vehicle. Popular perception of the Amish is of people rejecting technology and dressing like their ancestors and riding in a horse and buggy. And that's part of the story, but it's only part of the story. So previous scholarship, I would say there's been more books written about the Amish in the last 10 years than in the previous 40. First of all, there was a 1,300-page double-sided PhD thesis in 1956, which was an ethnographic study of the Amish of Holmes County. And then after that came John Hostetler's book. He wrote both those at the same copy, same book, different editions. He was raised Amish, so he was able to give a lot of insights that researchers don't normally get. Um, Gertrude Henders Huntington's long PhD thesis was really very in-depth. I don't know if there's anything she doesn't cover in 2,600 pages. But there's a lot of things that she was not able to get the insider's view on because she was not an Amish herself, whereas John Hushtetler's book will talk about um, the sanctions to the disobedient. It will talk about the Ordnung and gives examples of Ordnung which you don't see written down. Um, it's still a fascinating study and, and is a baseline for how the world as well as the Amish have changed in that time. He wrote about the Old Order Amish in Pennsylvania and she wrote about the Old Order Amish in Holmes County. So I ought to tell you that there are Old Order and New Order and I work with both of those but there are some more conservative people who are the Schwartz and Truber, the Andy Weaver, the King branch and every time there's a um, a division over something to do with the Ordnung. They they name themselves after the bishop who'd led the group away. So that's why they've got Bishop Swartzman Truber was very key. And now that's probably the most conservative group that there is. They don't have indoor plumbing. They don't have hot water. They don't have um, upholstery. They are very, very strict and their sanctions are, are really, uh, I don't know what the word would be, but very difficult to get your head around really in the 21st century. Um, the group of uh, Amish that I work with are Old Order and New Order. The New Order was founded in 1967, and uh, I think they're more conservative than the Old Order, which is strange. Twelve years after the 1963 publication of the, the book there on the left, Donald Crable started writing his books, and he has been the most prolific author on the Amish in the last um, years. He's written 18 books and many, many, many journal articles. He was Hostetler's research assistant. As well as writing academic journals, he writes um, books for tourists, I suppose you'd say. And then there's some specialist books there. The one there that's called The New York Amish is just about the Schwartz and Truber. This is um, the book that accompanied a PBS broadcast that was broadcast about three years ago now, of oh, 2013, so yeah, three years ago. 
and it's again major reference book the co-authors one is a historian and one is an anthropologist so how did I get to doing that um, oh I'll tell you one other thing before I do that um, as well as the books there's a website for people who are interested in the Amish which is Amish America and it tells you lots of up-to-date information so the last time I was there I was with my friends Elmer and Anna they live in the Lancaster settlement in Pennsylvania and they were really surprised because I asked them are you banking then in the new Amish bank in bird in hand and they didn't know how did you know there was a new bank there well it's the first bank that's been set up for a long time and it has the distinction of being um, funded by the Amish as well as for the Amish. Mm. So that they were very curious. I got my information from the Amish America website. Oh. I first became interested in the Amish, I suppose, when I was doing my first degree, which I don't want to tell you when that was, but it was, if I tell you I graduated in 1975, it's quite a while ago. And at that time I was interested in all types of communal living. Um, lots of people were in the 1970s, I guess. And I was reading about Hutterites and Amish and Moravians and, 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 and Koinoni Fellowship and all of that kind of thing. Uh, I started to get coffee table picture books on the Amish because they look nice. I like them, I like the communal aspect. Then I had a career in career management and that went on for 32 years and towards the end of that I studied for a part-time MSc programme in change management and I got interested in how change happens. A little earlier I'd had a 50th birthday and my husband had arranged for us to go on a surprise holiday to the Amish in Pennsylvania, arranging for us to stay in what he thought was an Amish guest house and I knew immediately it wouldn't be but I didn't like to tell him that. So we went there and um, the couple who owned it, Eli and Barbara, had left the Old Order Amish and they're now Amish Mennonite and they're allowed, they dress plain so they dress pretty much like you saw in the picture. They're allowed to have electricity but not for television, no music, nothing fancy, it's just for cooking and heating and the guest house. But it was a lovely holiday and I really enjoyed it, they kept trying to get me to go to various tourist things, the Amish Waxworks Schoolhouse, no thank you, uh, a, a musical called The Shunning, no thank you, um, a ride in a commercial buggy ride, no thank you, don't want to do any of these, and they were really trying to find things that I could do that I would enjoy, but I was really happy sitting on their veranda watching the Amish go by, mm. because it's on a main route and you can see the children walking to school across the road, why would you go and look at a waxwork when you can see real children going to the real Amish school over the road? So Eli came to me one day and he said, um, Fran, it's my mother's 70th birthday on Thursday and my 10 sisters will all be there. We were all old old Amish and they'll all be there and I've got one sister who's really interested in the English. So would you like to walk down and meet them? <laughs> yes, of course I would. Yes, yes, of course I want to do that. So we went down the road and I met his sister Anna. He was right, she is really interested in the English. And she asked me loads of questions. And then in asking me questions, we discovered that we have the same birthday. So I was in a room with 10 Amish women and his mother who was having her 70th birthday. And Anna was dancing around the room saying, I've got an English twin, I've got an English twin. It was a very unlikely scenario, <laughs> but it was very pleasant. And we soon discovered that she and her husband and my husband and, and myself were kindred spirits. We've got lots of interests in common. So we began to spend time with them the rest of the holiday that we were there. We went to market with them and we went out to dinner with them and we went to dinner at their house. And one time she said, um, I've got a question to ask you. When you, if you ever come back to America, would you take us traveling with you? Wow. So I said, yes, of course. So we've taken them, we've gone back well, we go back a lot, but we've gone back and taken them travelling and gone to different places. And over the years, as I was travelling there, because I've gone, been going there now for 14 years, uh, it was easy to see changes taking place in the community. People giving up farming, beginning to have small home-based businesses, the Amish having more contact with the English, the Amish not speaking Pennsylvania Dutch, even among themselves they would speak English sometimes. 
And I knew that a lot had already been written about the changes in the business life and how the men have been very successful. But there wasn't very much written about women and how it had affected women. I could find about four pages. So it seemed like a topic I would enjoy researching and finding out about. I didn't quite know how I was going to do it, but I thought it would be something there worth, worth looking at. And eventually I found my supervisor in Birmingham and started on this part-time PhD programme, which has become Amish Women Work and Change. Mm. And although I was planning to do my work in Pennsylvania, because I got friends there and I thought Anna would help me to get into the community. I didn't want to damage our friendship, but Ben, my supervisor, said before I got that far, well, really, you should go and do a pilot study in Ohio. So every time he said that, I said, yeah, OK, I'll go to Ohio, <laughs> thinking, I don't know anybody in Ohio. I don't know how to find anybody in Ohio. Mm. But there was a very serendipitous collection of happenings and eventually I was able to go there and I stayed with an elderly Amish couple and another ex-Amish woman who acts as a gatekeeper for me identifying old and new older women that I could identify that I could interview and I could ask them about the changes and how they feel about it and what's changed for them and um, how do they feel about the changes that's taking place in the community what do they think will happen in the future have you snowball sampling and each time I interviewed someone, I would ask if they knew of somebody else. Mm. It was a bit haphazard, but over two years, I made three fieldwork trips and stayed in a lot of different Amish homes, interviewed 38 women in detail, usually spending about two, or th two hours with them, maybe more, um, sometimes being invited back for dinner. So that's going to sisters' days, the women spend a lot of time together, so I would go to sisters' days and talk to them. I go to, oh, that's a quilting frame in somebody's house, so they would come round and quilt. That's where the elderly couple that I stay with, so they would sit around there quilting. They won't have their photographs taken, so there's nobody there. But we would sit around the quilting frame, and I'd turn my recorder on, and we would sit and talk. And there you can see them quilting again, and you can see a few Amish arms and, and fingers sewing. And I turned up to family frolics, and we canned vegetables <laughs> and baked bread and weed carrots, and all the time I'm talking to people. So I've done lots of things within the community. Um, in Ohio and in Pennsylvania and it's a combination of ethnographic observation from living with the families and combined with interviewing women. It was very enjoyable but not without its challenges. Sometimes it would be really nerve-wracking to spend the money on an airline ticket to go back not knowing what am I going to do when I get there. Mm. I've got some accommodation for the first few nights but I don't know who I'm going to talk to. Am I going to talk to anybody? Will they keep talking to me? Because you can't make appointments ahead of time. The Amish don't, Amish don't use diaries. Their modus operandi is that you turn up at somebody's door. And more than once I've just turned up at the door. It's so very un-English. <laughs> and, and they would say, do I know you? Mm. And I would say, well, no, but my name's Fran and I'm from England. And Elsie Klein sent me, or Mary Beachy sent me, or mm. Anna Esch sent me, whoever it was. And at first it felt really uncomfortable and very intrusive because they're busy people. But um, I was never turned away and gradually I felt confident to do it like that. And now I have no qualms about doing it at all because a lot of them know who I am. Mm -hmm. When it's possible I use a digital voice recorder to record the interviews. Only a few times they've not wanted me to record them. And the reason they don't want you to record them is because they think of a voice recording as a photograph of the voice. Mm -hmm. And they don't do photographs. They don't allow photographs. If they wouldn't let me record them, then I would take copious <coughs> notes and very rusty speed writing. It was a bit sad, really, having to do that. Um, but non-directive, semi-structured interviewing to ask a range of questions about how they live now compared with how they grew up, how their mothers lived, how their grandmothers lived, what changes they like or dislike what work their husbands do now compared to what they used to do when they got married, whether or not they earn their own money, and if they earn their own money, what do they do to earn it? 
and mostly it worked. I got lots of things, lots of information about things I hadn't read about. Um, they told me things I had already learned through reading. But because the ordning is variable from one congregation to another, it was it can be interpreted um, flexibly, variably, I suppose. And that inevitably means that there's not really going to be a cookie-cutter way to be English, to be Amish. It seems as though, because they all look alike, the temptation is to think, well, you know, they are all pretty similar. And there, there is some kind of facial characteristics that are similar, because they, they all came from a very small number of families. Mm. So there is a similarity. Um, but gradually I began to realise I'd got a body of information that hadn't always already been written down. So what are the main changes? Um, I'll talk about them by the number of people who told me about them. So the first thing that people told me about was that they do fewer things together compared with what they used to do. Oh. So they're not farming so much now at all. and now that they don't do as many things together because they always used to do things on the farm together that has given them a lot more free time because they're not tied to milking cows twice a day um, it's given them a lot more contact with people who are not Amish it's given them opportunity to well they have to create opportunities to do things together because they don't need to do it together for the farming so some of that's attributed to machinery now doing the work that people previously did together. And some of it's just because they don't do the work at all. But they tell me stories about how they would pick corn manually, six or eight of them, and work together for 12 or 14 hours a day for two or three days until all the corn had been picked. And now it can be done with a man, a buggy, and a harvester, sometimes with a boy. And that can just do the harvest in one day. Today the farms share either a baler or a wrapper because the practice now is to wrap the corn in big plastic bales like giant marshmallows. Are we talking about corn corn on the cob or corn wheat? Corn wheat, sorry, yeah. And so they wrap and it's in these enormous big bales in the corner of the field but it's all wrapped by a machine where they used to do it themselves. They used to pick the corn stand it, stack it, dry it, and then go back and wrap it up, and then take it to the barn. Um, and it might or might not have been wrapped in anything, sometimes it was just tied together. But they worked together to do that, where now it's all done by a machine. The next thing that they told me about was the decline in dairy farming. And that's come about because a lot of the increased regulation for farmers to refrigerate their milk and to store it in refrigerated bulk tanks. To do that, you have to have electricity, yeah. and they don't have. If they want their milk to be sold to a bottling plant, it's got to be refrigerated. Lack of electricity makes refrigeration difficult. It's not impossible, but it makes it difficult. And if it's not refrigerated at all stages, it can't be used except for cheese making. In the past, women made the cheese at home by hand and sold it at the farm gate. But again, state regulation has meant that they can't do that now because unpasteurized products can only be sold with state approval and some some states ban it completely so if you're in Pennsylvania you can't get unpasteurized milk or cheese um, so that makes it impossible for the Amish farms without the means to refrigerate their milk to carry on trading in other districts the, the Ordnung doesn't allow the use of electric generators to power the refrigerators mm. The Amish, in other areas, the Amish are unwilling to agree to the use of bulk trans tankers to store the milk. And others don't allow the milk to be collected on a Sunday. But the cows don't know it's Sunday, so they still need milking. But if it was collected on a Sunday, it means the farmer's got to work on a Sunday, and that's, it's not acceptable. Some of the more conservative Amish churches don't agree to the use of bulk tankers in case Amish farm milk gets mixed with English farm milk. Huh because their ordering views the importance of separation very, as being very important, very key for them. The women talked about the decline in the number of women sewing their own clothes. Historically, a woman would sew all the clothes for the family, including underwear, but now they buy the underwear. You rarely see, even the Schwarzentruber will buy their underwear. Um, the women 
used to make men's and boys shirts but now they again they, a lot of them buy them and they just adapt them by taking the buttons off in the pockets did you know that buttons were worldly mm. buttons are very worldly Goodness. you can get proud of how your buttons are so that's not good in Ohio it was especially noticeable that the young women didn't make their own clothes but bought them from an Amish clothing store or paid someone else to make them and that's another change it's one that's created a new career opportunity for those who enjoy sewing. So rather than having to just sew their own, they can now sew clothes for other people. Interestingly, where the women once sewed their clothes by hand, they can now use some of the most modern machinery. Now, she's not using a modern machine. Is that a foot treadle machine? Yeah, yeah. Mm. But they can use electronic machines, if their old man allows it, as long as they're powered by solar. I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Because Bernina is one of the more expensive makes of sewing machines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another big change has been the growth of the wedding season, both in terms of the expansion of time it takes and how they do it. Weddings are now usually in the spring or autumn, and they're still typically Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. That That's because when they were farming and there would be a wedding, everybody would just do their jobs down tools and go off to the wedding. Now that they have to accommodate to working for the English or have English people working for them, they've needed to be a little bit more organized about when they have the weddings. Wedding typically will have four or 500 guests and historically it was catered for by 30 people and it would be considered an honor to be chosen as a cook at a wedding. Nowadays, some other Amish women have made a business from doing the food preparation and the hot food cooking for a wedding. And for couples from less conservative Amish churches, the family may choose to have the wedding catered rather than do it traditionally. I talked to one lady who has a catering business and she told me that she will either provide the full service for the wedding, produce all the hams and all the chicken, or she'll just do whatever it is that they want. If she does the hot food, then she'll hire a truck and it will be taken um, in a, a, a truck that's got ovens to keep it hot mm. to the wedding reception. Then it's served by the servers as if they had produced it. During one of the times I stayed with her, she cooked between four and 500 portions of chicken every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday for nine consecutive weeks. Uh, it's a significant business. Our, our wedding season for the Amish is twice a year. 20 years ago, that job opportunity for such a catering business wouldn't have existed. Other women have done what they've always done. They've had kept a few chickens and they sell at the farm gate. But they also do things that you, you wouldn't expect. There isn't any connection between making homemade soaps, rugs and, egg, and selling eggs. And how you know that it's a, an Amish family is that the sign says no Sunday sales. Amish women have always been in charge of the house and garden and several academics have all noted separately that greater status is accorded to women who run their homes and gardens well. Some women have developed this into a job opportunity so now there are commercial greenhouses just run by women, selling to local people, selling to tourists, sometimes selling to other Amish. And they either develop that job in opportunity from their own garden, or they do it from additional land that they own or rent. So another woman I interviewed has a business making and selling hanging baskets, and she thinks nothing of selling nearly 2,000 a season. Fresh fruit, vegetables, jars of canned goods and hanging baskets all form part of the work traditionally gendered by the Amish as women's work that have been turned into successful businesses. They also use the businesses to train the children how to work. This is a really key thing for them because the Amish work ethic isn't caught, it's taught. And so they use the farm, use the business to teach the children to work. The first Amish child I ever met I said to him, so, um, Elmer, what do you what do you do on the farm? Oh, I look after the chickens, I collect the eggs. So he's walking to school in the morning and they go at seven o'clock. And how many hens have you got? 
Um, oh, about 400. But before he goes to school, he collects the eggs. So he's up four o'clock in the morning to do that. What age does that start at? Pardon? What age does that start at? They start training them to work when they're about three, three or four. Crikey. He was seven, I think seven or eight when I met him. Um, they see having a job on the farm or at home as part of training them to be responsible members of the family. And their families are quite big. I mean, even now, their families are six, seven, eight, nine children. They aren't as big as they used to be. I stay with two families where they have 19 children. Um, it's a different way of thinking and a different way of living. But by one woman? Pardon? By one woman? Uh-huh, yeah. By, with um, the demise of the farm, it's become necessary to find other opportunities to train the children, so they use these businesses as a way to do that. Working with their mum is one way to do it. One of the biggest surprises to me in my research was the discovery that Amish women are active in multi-level marketing businesses. So companies like Amway and Clean Easy and Avon and NSA, mm -hmm. where the distributors not only sell the product but recruit others into the business to, um, to share their business success. And people brought into the business like that are known as their downline. Amish have always been very interested in health and health products, vitamins, natural products, things like that. They tend to use natural medicine rather than going to, to a, a pharmacy or a hospital. I met two women who had really strong businesses um, selling these products. Uh, the business is called AIM. I don't know what it stands for, but it's um, the herbal products. And one of them had a downline of almost a thousand and another eight hundred. And these are women, old order Amish women, who are going everywhere by horse and buggy, having a phone in the barn, not using a computer, but they've got sizable businesses. And that was almost four years ago, so I'm sure by now their businesses are bigger than that. Miriam, the first one, told me, because I couldn't keep from sharing about people how much better I felt since I was using these products and how healthy I felt. They could have better health too. <clears throat> when I did that, my health business just began to grow. People sent me their friends and family to tell me about the business. I never intended to have a health business. It just happened when I couldn't quit telling them about how much better I was feeling. So her business grew easily and she became a top salesperson. Within the first two years, she was rewarded with a free, free trip to a sales convention. And since then, she's been to Hawaii, Arizona, Texas, Virginia, Utah, and two trips to Florida. But not by horse and buggy. No, on the <laughs> bus. They use the Greyhound a lot. Or they could go by train. She told me that she got into trouble for going to Hawaii because you can't go to Hawaii except by flying, and the old order Amish are not supposed to fly. But she and her husband decided to fly anyway and um, take the consequences but she told me they wouldn't be doing it again. Um, so she had nearly 1,000 people in her business and most of them would be Amish. Second example is Clara. Clara's a young married woman, I would say, in her mid-30s. And she works the, the business with her husband, Caleb. And in nine years, they built the business from nothing to having a downline of 700. Also in those nine years, she had five children. They have the downline in 42 states and more than 650 of them are women. Again, all, all Amish. She told me somewhat regretfully that because she's already been rewarded with two Caribbean cruises, they won't be able to go on any more cruises because her husband had just become a minister in the mm. church and a cruise would be frowned on as being too worldly. One of the things I think I'm seeing is a change in how how plain the Amish community is now compared with how plain it used to be. The, um, in Hochstetler's book, he talks a lot about what the Amish houses look like and how they have plain white walls and wooden floors and blinds at the windows that can be white or green and no decorations. Um, he talks about plain dress and houses being plain, simple and plain lifestyles. 
denoting that their life on earth is, n is not really what matters to these people. They're on their way to somewhere better. Well, it's true that they still live differently and the degree of separation is not as great as it was. But now that many of them are in business and not on the farm, they have more free time. They have more prosperity. They have more disposable income. And that's led to a lot more material prosperity. You can see it in the houses, um, the landscape gardens. Inside the houses, you can see glass-fronted cabinets. Now, the ordinary used to definitely say they couldn't have glass-fronted cabinets mm -hmm. because people would be able to see what they'd got. they got. Wouldn't, they wouldn't have collections of anything. They wouldn't have knick-knacks and other non-essentials. But they have those things now. Traditionally, the Amish don't have carpets or wallpaper. They have wooden floors. Um, they still don't have wallpaper downstairs, but upstairs, where the bishop might not go, you will find wallpaper. Oh. I'll, um, I'll show you a, a picture later that just is really, to me, very humorous. I think I want it as a cover picture on my PhD. So let me just talk a bit about this unyielding flexibility that I've called it. Really what it means is it looks like it always looked. And you, at a cursory glance, you would think nothing had changed. But actually, a lot of things have changed. They make changes that mean they're gradually altering, but not eroding their everyday lives. My first example is dress. So you can see there two Amish women. Now what's different about that is they're working in a restaurant. So 30 years ago they wouldn't have been working in a restaurant. It's an Amish owned restaurant. And they look quite distinctive to the other people who are there. You can tell that they've got plain dress. The dresses have, they, they always have the prayer covering so they always have the, the white bonnet on. When they go out they put a woolen bonnet over it. The dress is a fitted bodice and a full skirt and it's almost to the ankle. You can't see it in that picture. Over the bodice is a cape-like shawl and it's pinned around the waist and the dresses are always plain, usually dark colours, Gertrude and Huntington wrote in 1956. Plain colours, dark, um, never red or yellow. They're practical and pretty fitted well enough not to get in the way when the women work, but not tight to be binding. Well suited for nursing babies, opening down the front with straight pins. They don't have buttons, they don't have poppers. The men will have poppers, but the women pin their dresses. They have straight pins all down the front and sometimes down the sides as well. I don't know how they do it without pricking themselves, but they don't seem to. Um, they don't wear jewellery. They change, they put an apron on, so she's got a black apron, she's got a red apron, mm. but they, they would wear them to keep their, their dresses quite nice. Shoes are black and they're high topped in leather and when they go outside they wear black shawls. So the Amish clothing has always looked very different from everybody else. It's part of the way that we know that they're Amish. It serves as an identifier and it separates them from the rest of the population. Fifty years later, the dress still serves as a marker, but it's slightly different. The overall appearance hasn't changed. The significance of the women's dress is unchanging. It remains modest, comfortable rather than fashionable. But it is changing because the women told me that one of the most significant ways their lives have changed from that of their mothers is that their winter dresses are now not made from heavy woolen fabrics, but from fabrics that can be washed. And that's interesting for them because it makes the workload lighter. Their, wash, their winter dresses used to need to be brushed and wiped, brushed and wiped before being sponged down because they couldn't be washed. Mm. Now that the fabrics can be washed, even the heavier winter dresses can be washed. And the summer fabrics of summer clothes are frequently made from drip dry fabrics. So that's a big change. It makes their lives much easier. Laundry used to take two or three days and now it can be done in one day. Again, they're doing things, they all, they're doing the things they always did, so they all, they've always baked, but now they bake for restaurants, mm -hmm. or they bake for catering companies, or they bake for 
people who will just call at the house and buy a pie. They'll put a sign outside saying pies available. The laundry equipment itself has changed. The women told me that in their mother's day, they used to wash everything by hand and then put it through a wringer before putting it on the line to dry. Nowadays, they have the equivalent of a twin tub machine mm -hmm. and you can still see the wringer there. And then it's hung outside on the washing line to dry. A smaller number of women have automatic washing machines that have been adapted by ingenious Amish men. So they buy a regular machine in a catalogue, Sears catalogue or Walmart or wherever, and then they take it to an Amish man locally who will adapt it to run from compressed air or from solar power. <laughs> but it looks just the same as ours. So that's the dial on it. You can actually see the, the writing behind the um, yeah. plate that he's put on there where it would have said um, the type of wash, the speed, whatever. But he's just put something on there. So that says wash, drain, spin, rinse, drain, spin. Mm -hmm. Because it has to be simpler. The automatic washing machines are very much loved by the few women who have them because they're able to, much as we do, put washing in and then get on with another task. They don't have to be doing anything else. And then it's hung on the, the line to dry, like that. And what's curious about that is that you can see the range of colours has extended far beyond plain dark colours. That's an older lady's washing line. Mm. But you can see on that one, there's teal, there's orange, there's red. In the old one um, that Gertrude Henders quoted from, Gertrude Hunting Huntington quoted from, yellow and red and orange are specifically forbidden. But now mm. they've moved on to having those. And even there, there's a red shirt. Mm. So are those still pinned together? Uh, some of those are pinned and some of them are sewn, yeah. I know that family and they, the older girls pin theirs because they like it, but the younger ones, they, they've stitched them. Considering the appearance of the shoes, many women still wear the black high top shoes, but they might not be leather, they might not be high top. They might be made from something other than leather. A lot of the young girls wear trainers and they might or might not be black. The um, ordnance won't be applied rigidly to the young people who have not yet become been baptised, so they get away with um, wearing trainers, but they probably would still not wear them for church. One of the things I noticed through about three years ago when I went was that suddenly a lot of the Amish were wearing Crocs, which I just thought that was astonishing because they're a fashion shoe. And I said to one of the ladies, Amanda, I see you're wearing fashion shoes now. And she said, yeah, aren't they? I like them to wear them in the house and the garden. They're so comfortable. And I said, what does Jacob think? Jacob is their minister. Oh, it's all right, as long as they're black. <laughs> but she wouldn't wear them for church. So the dress looks the same, but there are some changes. And they're keeping to the rules by wearing Crocs as long as they're black. This is Ruth. Um, you can see there Ruth is wearing trainers. Ruth is posing for a photograph. Mm. Now, she said to me, will you take a picture of me? And I said, well, I can, but I wouldn't. She asked me, did I have a camera? And I said, yes, I do. Would you take a picture of me in my garden? So I said, well, I can, but it wouldn't occur to me to do it, Ruth. And she said, oh, nobody's going to make a grave an image of me. Look at me, that's the reason we don't do it. But nobody will, I just love a photograph. So I took a photograph and she's wearing trainers. This photograph really amuses me because you can see they've got swags in different shades of blue at the, at the window. Mm. But if you were looking at that window from outside, what would you see? Just the blinds. Just the blinds. Yeah. And it was like that at every window in that room. And I asked her, um, I know Ruth pretty well now, and I said to her, Ruth, this is a very um, elegant room nowadays. And she said, yeah, the bishop's room is downstairs. 
so when the bishop comes to visit he never gets to see the sitting room that's an upstairs room yeah mm. well because of the way they've built their house mm. it looks out it's the lounge is upstairs and it looks out it's beautiful mm. um my second example about unchanging flexibility um so it's a glass fronted cabinet full of nice fancy things mm. Feels really strange to be talking about a woman's kitchen, but that's how they view it. Work is gendered and the women work in the kitchen. Mm. Gertrude Enders Huntington said the lack of electricity was most noticeable in in the kitchen. And the reason they give for not using electricity is that it's if they did that they would be really closely connected to people in the world. Depending on the power line is quite contrary to how they are because the power power line belongs to somebody else and they want to only depend on God and they don't want to be joined to anybody who is using this power line because they use it for all kinds of ungodly things. Um, there's also something else, it's a bit spiritual, it's to do with electricity being a bit mysterious to them. They, do, they only have a, an eighth grade education and it doesn't in, it doesn't encompass any science mm. so they don't really understand how electricity works and they think of it as a spiritual thing they know that it's power and it comes from the world so they also think that the power in the world is from the devil and not from God and therefore it must be sinful and if they allow the power into their homes it might destroy them with all of the things that they could bring into their house they could bring in um, computers, TV, music, the internet, mm -hmm. things that would not help them to get to heaven, which is mm -hmm. where, they, where they all believe they're going. They also might get very proud with how quickly they could do things, because they don't think that's a good thing to be. Proud is a terrible sin in the Amish world and the Amish thinking. And they'd lose their sense of separation from the world because there wouldn't be any difference between how they live and how anybody else lives. But that's an Amish kitchen, and it looks a little bit old-fashioned, but also has all the things that we might expect to find. So they've got lights, they've got a fridge and a freezer, there's a nice big cooker. But no dishwasher? No, no, because that's part of training your children. If you've got a large number of children, the children learn to do the dishes. Oh, How are it. these things powered? Compressed air solar battery right. it depends which it no, depends generator basically. sometimes you can have a generator okay. um, did they use gas yep yep gas refrigerators gas freezers um they have all these kind of um well crable calls it cultural bargaining things that they will agree to do and not do so right. they can use a lock-up fridge refrigerator or a lock-up freezer if it's plugged into the electric because they don't own it so they're just going there and using their freezer owned by somebody else and paying rent for that mm. on a monthly basis they just have all these little workarounds it's very interesting um, sometimes they'll have batteries in the basement enormous batteries that will power things for days on end yeah. um, electric floor polishers you can find food processors. So I've got there some examples of how different it looks. It's a gaslight fixture. There's a skylight. They quite often have skylights, which are really interesting. There's a smoke detector there on mm. the top right, and that's unusual. There's a lot of arguments about when they should have smoke detectors because that's almost relying on an invention of man rather than trusting in God to keep you safe. Laminated flooring. They have, often they will have water from a well on their property. Mm. So do they have a pump on that or? Mm -hmm. Compressed air. <laughs> That's um, a pantry. There's a food processor, there's a mixer, mm. there's a yoghurt maker, there's a blender. Protein shake. <laughs> yeah, there's a protein shake. So that's gas powered. That's gas powered, yeah. I can't 
can't even begin to think how that works. Maybe. Yeah. Some of their things are um, historically they've in recent history they've had bottled gas, but in Ohio they found gas on the land of lots mm. of the Amish people, and so they have um, come to it doing deals with the gas companies where they can have the gas well on their land and it can be used and it, the gas can go wherever gas goes to be used by everybody else but they get free gas for life it's very strange it's their gas that they're giving yeah rather than taking it from yeah right. that's right mm. um you might find not much difference between their kitchens and ours they have floor polishers they have all the equipment that we've seen washing and ironing continues they do it but it it's become all much easier now that they can have the power to do it on their property um, and I've used that as another example of unchanging flexibility it's unchanging because they still do it on a weekly basis the washing and the ironing mm. but there's a flexibility because they've got twin tub machines they're not powered by gas but by battery or solar electricity a small number of the women have got automatic washing machines um, they like to use now solar whenever they can because they see that as coming directly to them from God they even talk about it as being God's electricity and the machines are adapted for use by the Amish men to meet the needs of the community so that they don't have to violate the ordinance they can have solar mm. they all agreed for that it's just adapting but it all looks the same so I hope that's an insight into Amish life and how it's changing there are lots of changes I haven't mentioned I tried to choose ones that I thought would resonate with how we live because sometimes when I'm talking about it I realize if you haven't been there just as you said it's really hard to imagine what does that look like mm. how can that operate how can they do that but they see themselves as keeping too much progress at bay but choosing which things they will allow to change and it's trying to get a handle on that riddle of how much change can we allow without it really altering how we live mm. And that's, a, again, a key thing to them, but that's why I've called it unchanging flexibility. It all looks very similar to how it did for their grandmothers. The work's similar, but it's made easier if things have been allowed to change and they have accommodated labour-saving devices, but it is changing.